So this is not keep coming back to you, get it right. <laughs> I have to say a word about John Perkins. Um, it was just a precious moment to see you, John. I have such vivid memories. When I was very young, just out of seminary, and the civil rights, was, civil rights movement was flourishing, John invited me down to Mendenhall, Mississippi. I think I, I, think I came down six years in a row over a periods of time, and uh, uh, we had some amazing adventures. Um, because of my association with him, the sheriff hauled me into jail. And he said, we're fining you for doing what you're doing. I said, I'm preaching the gospel. I was going around with you to the high school. And, and he said, well, we're fining you. I said, how much? He said, how much you got? <laughs> he took all my money, which wasn't a whole lot. I, I don't want to take the time to give you the history of this, but John and I, with Charles Evers, who was... Uh, I think he was the first mayor uh, in the South, black mayor in the South. Is that true? I think I remember that. Of an integrated city. And his brother was Medgar Evers, who was the first martyr of the civil rights movement. And Charles and John and I and a couple other guys were in Jackson, Mississippi. We were up in a room, and we were talking. I was the only white person in there. And a guy burst through the door and said, Martin Luther King has been shot. And everything went crazy, and, and they, they tried to get me out of there because I stood out, you know, like a snowman. <laughs> and hustled me through Jackson, put me in a car, and we went to Memphis, remember? And I climbed, I went up the second floor of the little building, I, I climbed up on the on the toilet, and I looked out the window where James Earl Ray stood when he shot Martin Luther King. And then we went up to the balcony where he died and saw the blood stains there. Amazing moment. Amazing moment. John's been faithful through the years uh, to the gospel, to his people. Wonderful to see you. Good to meet you, John. Grandson of Philip, trombone player. Good to see you. Well, uh, this is a great privilege uh, for me to um, talk to you. I, I'm, I'm going to introduce the um, Mullins Lectures this morning, if that's allowed. I, I want to talk to you about the subject of parables. Parables. I fear <clears throat> there are 40 or so parables in the New Testament, in the Gospels. I fear this generation may be losing the significance of the parables. They are phenomenal preaching material. Just amazing to preach. So this afternoon, I'll take you through the preaching of some of the parables so that you can kind of get a feel for how to handle them. But in this session, I want you to understand the genre itself of parables. So open your Bible to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Verse 1. That day, mark that. That day may seem pretty generic to you. In fact, it is not. This is an ominous this is a, a, a massive day in the life of our Lord. That day, Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea, and large crowds gathered to him, so he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd was standing on the beach. He did this on occasions to put some distance between himself and the crushing crowd and also the water acted as a, an amplifier so that he could be heard by the tens of thousands. But then verse 3 is what I want you to notice. And he spoke many things to them in parables. You read that and you say, <clears throat> is that special? What is special is 
He had never done that before. He had never done that before. And this, by the way, is near the end of his second year of ministry. Oh, in the Sermon on the Mount, he had uh, referred to a tree. He'd referred to sheep's clothing. He had said that um, some people are, are like a man who builds a house. But in the whole of the Sermon on the Mount, there are no parables. In fact, for two years, there really hadn't been any parables. This is a moment that is absolutely critical to understand. This is a defining day in the life of our Lord. Essentially, two years to get to the point where He starts to speak in parables. And what led to that? What led to that dramatic alteration of His ministry style? What led to that character change in His teaching? What led Him to shift from straightforward doctrine, straightforward discourse, from Old Testament texts, for example, to all of a sudden telling stories? From this day forward, whenever He taught in public, He spoke in parables. What's going on here? This is dramatic. This is abrupt. This is ominous. To understand that, we have to kind of know what's going on on this day. So back up to chapter 12. The day began for our Lord as conflicts often began over the issue of the Sabbath. Chapter 1, verse 12 says it was a Sabbath day. And all of the legalism of Judaism had been sucked into the Sabbath, and the Sabbath became the symbol of everything. And to violate the Sabbath was to show disdain for the whole system. And Jesus did that purposely and repeatedly. So this day began over conflicts regarding the Sabbath. They had loaded down the Sabbath with a myriad of restrictions and and made it the most uncomfortable, frankly, miserable day of the week. Now, let me just remind you of what the original Sabbath law was from God. Here it is. It's complicated, so listen. Don't work. Period. Don't work. Take a day off. That's the Sabbath. And that's all there was to the Sabbath. It was intended as a day, as Isaiah 58, 13 says, a day of rest, a day of joy, a day of delight, a break. The Jews throughout their history, however, hadn't rested on the Sabbath day. They were, they were driven by a lot of things. They were driven by money. They were driven by ambition. They were driven by success. They were even driven by the participation in idolatry. Uh, They were uh, apostate. There was apathy toward the commandments of God, including this command. And so, by 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 the time we are reading through the Old Testament, by the time we close out the Old Testament, the, the, the Jewish nation is essentially apostate. And like all the commandments of God, uh, the, the Sabbath is basically ignored. Well, the rabbis get a hold of this, and and the rabbis need to fix this, and the Sabbath day is pretty easy to fix because it appears to them to be external, so they start piling up rules and laws to force the Jews to keep the Sabbath, and by the time you come to the life of Christ, it's just a horrendously disturbing, uncomfortable, frustrating day. It had become a symbol of their religion loaded down with rules. And Jesus, walking on the Sabbath, that's a no-no, plucking grain on the Sabbath because He and His disciples were hungry. They are beginning to do that when the Pharisees who dogged His steps throughout His life and ministry 
saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples do what is not lawful to do on a Sabbath. Um, he reminded them in verse 8, Don't know who you think you are, but I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. This Sabbath conflict was epic. He gave a little story about how some of David's men ate the showbread, and necessity trumps their foolish rules on the Sabbath. And then, blatantly, he went into the synagogue. This is the day. He went into the synagogue. A man was there whose hand was withered. They questioned Jesus, asking, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him? He said to them, what man is there among you who has a sheep? And he goes on to say, people help their animal out of a ditch on a Sabbath. Why wouldn't you want to help a man? And verse 13, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out. It, it was restored to normal like the other. Verse 14, the Pharisees went out and conspired against him as to how they might destroy him. Isn't that a little overreaction? What? Picking grain on the Sabbath? Healing a man's hand on the Sabbath? They got past the miracles pretty fast? To just make it worse, verse 22 says, A demon-possessed man, blind and mute, was brought to Jesus. He healed him so that the man spoke and saw that's a wonderful thing to do. They made a decision, verse 24. They said about Jesus, this man casts out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. What had Jesus done that day? Violate their Sabbath by picking grain. Violate their Sabbath by healing a man. Violate their Sabbath by casting out demons. And their conclusion was, he is from hell. He is from hell. He is satanic. Obviously, this is horrendous blasphemy. In verse 31, drop down, Jesus calls it blasphemy. In verse 37, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. They are divinely condemned by the Lord of the Sabbath, for the blasphemy, the incomparable blasphemy of saying the Son of God is from hell. That is someday, and it's not over. It's not over. According to Mark chapter 4, verse 35, Jesus then left that same Sabbath day, that synagogue and that encounter, and got in some boats and went across the north shore of the Sea of Galilee and got to the other side early in the evening. When he got to the other side on that day, uh, he, he ran into a man running down the mountain, Mark 4 says, screaming like a banshee who was loaded up with a legion of demons, and you remember that whole story, how Jesus uh, cast out the demons and sent them into a herd of pigs who then did a swine dive into the... Like, it was some day. Turn to Mark 4 for a moment. It was some day. Amazing day. Verse 33. Same day. With many parables. He was speaking the word to them so far as they were able to hear it. And listen to verse 35, uh, verse 34. He did not speak to them without a parable, but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. From that day forward, when he spoke publicly, he spoke parables. The question is, why? 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 Why does he all of a sudden start speaking in stories? Well, we are told. He was realizing they weren't getting it. You know, propositional, didactic discourse, 
doctrine, theology, exposition of the Old Testament not getting through. And, and, and Jesus uh, finally realizes, which is hard to imagine after two years his omniscience kicked in and he figured out this isn't working, finally realized, I've got I to change my strategy here. My message isn't getting through. Straightforward propositions aren't doing it. Clear truths don't work. I need to be a storyteller. Well, contemporary advocates of uh, storytelling in the pulpit answer this is exactly what he did. And this is what you read in the literature today. Jesus was the master storyteller who could give depth and insight by his stories. You've heard that. This is the genre we must use. We must become storytellers. People love stories. They love narrative. Uh, he told stories because stories make things clear and stories make things accessible and stories make things easy. And, and so the best method for all preachers is to tell stories because from that day on, Jesus finally figured it out. He didn't speak to anybody unless He told them stories. So you read, for example, from Eugene Lowry, quote, a sermon is not a doctrinal lecture. It is an event in time, a narrative art form more akin to a play or novel in shape than to a book. Hence, we are not engineering scientists, we are narrative artists by professional function. Does it not seem strange, he goes on, to you that in our speech and homiletical training we seldom considered the connection between our work and that of a playwright, novelist, or television writer? I propose that we begin by regarding the sermon as a homiletical plot, a narrative art form, a sacred story. Well, that's precisely the kind of preaching that now dominates many evangelical and megachurch pulpits for sure, for sure. In many cases, the pulpit is even gone. Somebody's wandering around telling stories. The key people, and you're trying to find them, <laughs> the key people on the church staff are those who assist the storyteller with videography and acts. Declaring truth in propositional form, we're told, is out. It's not vogue. What is vogue is to tell stories, and because stories encourage people to find themselves in the narrative. Stories are supposedly more hospitable, they're more meaningful, they're more genteel than the brute, unambiguous facts of doctrine. Truth claims offend people. So that perspective on preaching has steadily gained acceptance for three or four decades, really. This isn't anything new. It's uh, kind of come alongside as a partner with the development of pragmatic church growth strategies. A religious publisher advertises an influential book dealing with the uh, revolution in preaching. Uh, this is a book called A New Hearing from Abingdon Press, written by Richard Esslinger. Preaching is in crisis. Why? Because the traditional conceptual approach no longer works. It fails to capture the interest of listeners. The old topical conceptual approach to preaching is critically, if not terminally, ill. Hmm. Countless recent books on preaching have echoed that assessment, something similar. The remedy then, what's, what do we do with this obsolete preaching that we're engaged in? What do we do if, if the old ways are critically, if not terminally, ill? Here's, here's a typical solution. Contrary to what some would have us believe, story, not doctrine, is the Bible's main ingredient. We do not have a doctrine of creation. We have stories of creation. We do not have a concept of the resurrection. We have narratives of Easter. There is relatively little in either the Old Testament or the New Testament that does not rest on narrative or story. From somebody named William White, speaking in stories. Statements like that, are we to listen to that? Are we to buy into that? 
In the first place, he doesn't seem to know the difference between a story and history. But set that aside. We do have a doctrine of creation. He doesn't. We do. We do have a doctrine of the resurrection. Have you read 1 Corinthians 15 lately? It is patently false to say we do not have a doctrine or a concept of the resurrection when you have that long chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, which is a systematic, pedagogical, polemical defense of the resurrection replete with exhortations, arguments, syllogisms, and abundance of propositional statements one after another after another after another. Separating Jesus' stories from propositional doctrinal truth is the nonsense of postmodern language deconstruction. The goal of which is to eliminate truth so people can sin without guilt. There is a very interesting book that I would commend you to read. It's called Homespun Gospel. It sounds like a book by Bill Gaither, but it's not. <laughs> Homespun Gospel is by Todd Brenneman, and it's a, it's a Ph.D. dissertation at Oxford. The subtitle is How Sentimentalism Has Triumphed Over the Evangelical Church. And a lot of that triumphant sentimentalism that has replaced doctrine has come about by sloppy thinking and sloppy preaching on the parables. Writing on this subject of sentimentalism, he, he says, Brenneman says things like this, emotion has taken over evangelicalism. Sentimentalism has taken over, and evangelicals have abandoned the mind for feeling as the basis of their religion. Doctrine is downplayed. Sentimentalism undermines the very spiritual goal it purports to achieve. He says sentimentalism promotes narcissism, post-Christian humanism, and psychology. The individual is the center of God's interest. He says sentimentalism preys on weak minds and weak wills. Domesticated, sentimental, divine love is featured. Childishness is key. Therapeutic rhetoric of narcissism gives authority to feelings and abandons theology. The authority is in you and in your feelings. He says, this evangelical blitz is never critiqued. Quote, evangelicalism can no longer carry the burden of intellectuality or doctrine. It has abandoned them and is traveling light. And the contemporary version of evangelicalism is a placebo. It cures nothing, no substance. And a lot of this playing around with sentimentalism, working on people's feelings, comes from tampering with the parables. For example, Charles Hedrick writes in a, a book called Many Things in Parables, it is the nature of narrative to lend itself to an auditor's imagination and become whatever the auditor wants it to be in spite of the narrator's intention. Narratives are, are essentially polyvalent, meaning having many valences, uh, many possible combinations, and therefore subject to a wide range of readings. Parables, uh, he says, work any way interpreters and auditors want them to work in spite of whatever Jesus may have intended with them. We simply do not know how Jesus used parables and clearly have no hope of ever discovering His intention. He's not finished. Interpreters of parables are not telling readers what Jesus actually meant with the parable. They simply do not and cannot know what they, they cannot know that. Interpreters describe what they think Jesus meant. Something vastly different, an explanation is evoked in a particular reader's mind from an engagement with a parable, and responses depend as much on what that interpreter brings to the parable as on what the parable itself says, perhaps more so. Had the interpreter been present in the audience when Jesus first spoke the parable, the situation would have been no different. My hypothetical modern interpreter, whom I have just taken back in time to the feet of Jesus, would still have to make sense of the parable as interpreters do today. Then as now, he says, others in the audience would have different responses. 
In this sense, the situation with interpretations of parables today is identical to what it would have been in the first century. Thus, no right interpretation of the parable is possible. By right, I mean interpretations that capture Jesus' intent. Given the nature of narrative, no one explanation is a, of a parable can rule out any or all others. Really? And he said all that in a book on parables? Why waste your time? Is that what parables are? Open-ended journeys into imagination? Sentimental stories? Was Jesus trying to get through to people that he finally realized weren't getting his message? Let's go back to Matthew 13 and answer that question. Verse 10. And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? Hmm. Have you arrived at the question? I think so. Why are you doing this? You would like an answer then, I suppose? Why? Jesus answered them, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. Do you know why Jesus spoke in parables? To hide the truth. Not to make it clear, to make it impossible. For whoever has... To him more shall be given. The parables for you will be explained and understood. But to them it has not been granted. End of verse 11. Whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from you. Even the most meager spiritual insight fades away. This speaking in parables is connected to that amazing passage in Isaiah 6, verse 13. I speak to them in parables because while seeing they do not see, they hear the story but don't get it, they can't understand it. That's why I talk to them in parables, to hide the truth. Listen, parables are a judgment. They are a judgment. Just like in Isaiah 6, you will keep on hearing but not understand, you will keep on seeing but not perceive. The heart of this people has become dull with their ears, they scarcely hear, they have closed their eyes, otherwise they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with the heart, return, and I would heal them. I will no longer speak to them in a way they can understand because I will not heal them. My spirit will not always what? Strive with man. The day of grace has ended when you've had a full revelation of the Son of God and concluded 180 degrees from the truth that He's from hell. And it's impossible to be renewed to repentance from that perspective. And there can be no more revelation. Parables aren't designed to make things clear to unbelievers. They're designed to hide them. Parables do not illustrate truth. They do not clarify truth for those with no ears to hear. That's why the guy writing the book on the parables can't understand the parables, because he doesn't have ears to hear. He's... <laughs> He should have started this book by saying, I am not a Christian. <laughs> okay, we get it. Jesus taught in parables as a judgment. A judgment on those who consistently over years had rejected His clear, biblical, propositional, theological, reasonable truth, preaching, and teaching. 
and he started to hide things. You know, it's just, it's not like this is some kind of mystery. They asked him why he did it, and he told them. How do all these people writing books on parables not see this? Do you know in Luke 12, 47 and 48, it says, to whom much is given, much will be required? That's, that's a judgment statement. That's, that, that's not just sort of out there in space meaning whatever you want it to mean. It's in a context of flogging. It's in a judgment context. Concealing truth is a judgment, but, but it is also tempered with mercy. Because what the Lord hides from the unregenerate unbeliever, the unregenerate unbeliever is not responsible for. And to whom much is given, much is required. If the Lord continued to make things clear to unbelievers, their eternal punishment would be even worse. So the Lord speaks in parables as a judgment tempered with mercy keeping them from adding guilt upon guilt upon guilt upon guilt upon guilt. Parables hide truth as a judgment. By the way, there are no parables in the Gospel of John, so you can't make a case that parables somehow dominate intending to force us to be storytellers. Further, there are no parables anywhere else in the New Testament. No preacher ever told parables. How didn't, how didn't they pick, on this, pick up on this? If we're all supposed to be storytellers, what happened to Paul? What happened to Peter, James, John, Jude? There are no parables. Do you know why there are no parables? Because no human can decide when judgment falls. Parables are the same today. You say, well, I understand them. Of course you understand them because Jesus explained them to his disciples. And because you have the full New Testament, you have the full theology. And because you have the full theology, you have the content that allows you to interpret the parables. If people don't believe the gospel, they can't interpret the parables. You who believe the gospel see the gospel in the parables. And oh, by the way, every parable is related to the gospel. There is no such thing as a parable about compassion. There is no such thing as a parable about helping people. There is no such thing as a parable about um, humility. There is no such thing as a parable about anything that isn't related to the gospel. In fact, parables are Jesus' theology of salvation in stories. They are profoundly doctrinal. They are profoundly theological. Well, I, I need to sort of wrap up. I left all the good stuff out. <laughs> Parables are gospel theology, theology of salvation. We know the unbeliever can't understand them, 1 Corinthians 2.14, right? The natural man understands not the things of God. That's just another way of saying the same thing. But you have the mind of Christ. So you, because, because we have... The, the, the early disciples, they, they needed explanations for everything, and the Lord has, in the text, given us some of His explanations, though not all of them. The ones that aren't explained in the text of the, of the Gospels, we, we understand because we have patterns of, uh, of the ones that Jesus does explain, so we know He's always talking about salvation, and because we have the rest of the New Testament, which fills out our soteriology and our understanding of the gospel, we can see those parables for what they are, for people who don't believe the gospel or understand the gospel, and for whom the parables are a judgment, they're nothing but riddles, stories without meaning. Of course those who reject the gospel of salvation can find no meaning in the parables. Of course they're open-ended. Of course they appeal to um, postmodern language deconstructionists who simply want to sin freely without guilt. Don't like what the Bible says. But for us, look at Matthew 13, again, 34. All these things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables. And he didn't speak to them without a parable. 
This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden hmm, since the foundation of the world. That's why he did what he did, he spoke in parables. But verse 36, then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable. You know, there's a sense in which that's kind of a downgrade from doctrinal preaching. You understand that? That's kind of a downgrade. For, for the sake of mercy and the purpose of judgment, Jesus had to double up on his teaching. He used stories that he then had to explain. Listen, all parables are doctrinal. All parables are theological, soteriological, propositional truth. All of them, when explained. All truth, for that matter, is more than propositional reality, but nevertheless. All truth is understood by logic, not sentiment, not emotion, not feeling. All truth is apprehended by rational grasp of propositions that form a reasonable argument leading to a propositionally stated final conclusion. Propositions are the building blocks of logic, the tools of reason. Let me tell you, every sermon, including a a sermon on the parables, every sermon is an argument. Every sermon is an argument. You're not working on people's feelings. Every sermon is a systematic argument of lining up sequential propositional truths that lead to a final propositional conclusion. Every sermon goes at the mind. We are, we are leading every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. One closing passage, Luke 10. This is the the, the connection that Luke brings to this. Luke 10, 23. Turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. For I say to you, many prophets and kings wish to see the things which you see did not see them, to hear the things which you hear, did not hear them. You're blessed. The parables are an incredible, rich source of theology, doctrinal truth. And since you know the doctrine, You can see the significance of the parables. This is a rich benediction. Father, we thank you that we've been able to think about this a little bit uh, this morning. Grateful, again, for your word and how it always pulls us back. And we find their consistency, clarity, conviction, direction. I pray out of this seminary you will raise up many, many, many great, gifted, faithful, powerful, effective preachers and leaders, proclaimers of your word. Continue to keep your hand of blessing on this place. Help us to be faithful to your word, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.